okay. It's going to be a little bit different with just a few of us, but I like the intimacy of it. So um, I want to just, again, like, I just want to be faithful to what God wants us. That's okay. Um, I just, I want to be faithful to um, just what God's heart is in through this book. Like, what does he want us to hear, to learn, to understand, to see? Um, so that's, you know, I make notes and I study and I do all these things, but I really just am trusting that the spirit will lead us because I, I, I guess I just feel the weight of the times we're living in. And I know that again, like it's my words aren't enough. Like we have to be, we have to have the spirit of God. I mean, in a real tangible way, we need to be led by the spirit. We need to be surrendered and humble before God. And so as we look at um, the book of judges, just to remind us kind of why we're, we've studied, we're studying this and the journey um, that we're on. So, you know, like I've said in the past, the time of judges, and I think as we're all seeing, like really does kind of represent the time that we're living in now in a very profound way. Um, we see this downward spiral of God's people, like falling into apostasy, forgetting God. And you can see that like in the church at large. Um, and I think this applies not only to the church, but also to Israel, right? Like God's people. Um, in the midst of this down, downward spiral, just as we studied last week, you know, there were these people that set themselves apart. There were these consecrated people that said, God, I will be used by you. So, so in the midst of this downward spiral of you know, what's happening in the church and in God's people, there also is this raising up of an army, this, this arising army that is preparing themselves to battle and to engage in the battle that God is, is calling us to. Um, for you, puppy. Um, the other kind of parallel that we see as we study judges um, is that, you know, what happens is in the midst of this downward spiral that God sends chastisement to his people. And the purpose of that chastisement, again, is going to be to cause them to repent, right? And so that is something that we should expect as, as we look at the last days, that God is going to bring, um, you know, foreign nations to invade his people and to chastise them, just like he's always done, in order to bring us, thanks, Judy, <laughs> Tova, in order to bring his people to repentance. And that's the heart of God. He wants us out of the delusion, out of the idolatry, and to bring us to repentance. And then finally, what happens in the book of Judges is that it ends, that era of the Judges ends with God raising up, anointing a king, and establishing his kingdom through that king, which was ultimately David. There were some steps along the way, but that's the picture, that's the type. And so that's what we long for and are waiting for is when God will anoint Yeshua, who already has been anointed, but he will come and establish the kingdom of God on the earth. And so just as the time of the judges ends with that, so too will this era that we're in end with the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. So that is exciting. Um, and so as we look at the book of Judges, we're watching God raise up Shophet, right? Shoftim, right? The Hebrew word, which means deliverer and rescuer. So God is rescuing his people and also bringing about his chastisement, his judgment against the enemy. Um, so as we do that, as we kind of walk through this journey of the book of Judges, we're, we're looking at those parallels. But at the same time, we're also gleaning from these judges, these Shoftim, different attributes of leadership that that God, you know, gave them or different strategies so that we also can learn and glean from that and understand how we are to live as, you know, these little judges in this time and the judge in the sense of those who can rise up to stand for truth and confront the enemy, but also rescue God's people. That's, you know, God's heart. And so we've talked about in our last few lessons, um, we learned about, and these, again, this is just review. We learned about the need for God's abiding and covering spirit. Um, we have to have the spirit of God in us. We need the spirit of God upon us. Um, we talked about the divine strategy against enemy plans. Um, we need God's wisdom and how to navigate through um, our daily lives right now. And then we need that steadfast courage and perseverance. And then last week we began looking at the greatest, probably the greatest judge in this time, which was Gideon. And we started this story and 
I loved how, you know, we're able to kind of really laser focus in on the, the battle that Gideon and the story of Gideon. And even within the greater book of Judges, in this story, we're able to see more patterns, more typology, more things that point to the end time. So there's kind of like this, you know, this story isolated in itself becomes very much a shadow and a type of the last days. And so we can learn a lot about the end times from this story. And we kind of began that, that journey last week. Um, and, and actually what you will see in the Bible, uh, many times in connection to the coming of Messiah is the phrase as in the days of Midian. And that's actually coming from this story in Judges chapter six through eight, as in the days of Midian, you're going to see that language throughout the prophets, um, to point towards the establishment of God's kingdom and the destruction of God's enemies. Um, so let's just kind of review the players. We've got Gideon. Obviously, he is the Shofet. He's the one who's been anointed to deliver and bring judgment. He is really going to be the type of Yeshua. He's a Messiah. Um, not in the sense of having that priestly role or that kingly role, um, which you'll, we'll see ironically at the end of Judges 8. He tries to take on both of those. Um, but he only is to be the judge, the role of Shof Shofet. We know that Yeshua, who was the greatest Shofet, will come also as priest and king. But Gideon plays a type. And then we talked about the Midianites and the Amalekites, and then this, these other nations from the east who have joined together, to conspired together against God's people. Um, so those nations represent, again, just a shadow of the type of the end times nations that will come against Israel. And even still, they do um, almost daily. We talked about... Um, how it begins with a seven-year period, right? That's how it starts. So we have that seven-year timeline of Daniel's 70th week. Um, we read in the chapter six of Judges about them coming to take all of their harvests. So they're coming not, they're coming to decimate the land and to take from them, right? And so what's happening is that the people of Israel are living in a time of famine. And Famine is very much part of the prophecies of the last days. Yeshua talks about it in Matthew 24, Revelation chapter 6, the seals, like the second seal is about, you know, the, the shortages of food. So that, again, is a shadow, a typology of what's going to happen in the last days. Um, and then we see the invasions happening at harvest time. Um, I believe that also points to um, the, the harvest that we bring in during Sukkot. So the, this is giving us the time period of when these things will, will take place. Um, we can read in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13, it talks about, and Ezekiel 38 is the war of Gog and Magog. That's obviously an end time battle, right? And that they, it specifically actually talks about them coming to pillage the land. And so we have that connection there with Ezekiel 38 and what's happening in Judges chapter 6. Um, and then just to review, um, again, we're, we're just reviewing from last week, but um, Judges chapter six, um, as, as Gideon, you know, not, again, not only are we looking at how does this point to the last days, what can we learn, but we're looking at how do we learn from Gideon? What do we learn from these different types of judges? And so we, we talked about Gideon's life and we talked about how, you know, when God saw Gideon, who was right scared inside of a wine press harvesting grain, God spoke over him you are a mighty valiant hero. You know, so we talked about how God wants to speak his purpose over us and encourage life in us. Um, and, and that God is willing to use people who are filled with doubt and fear. And how many times, I mean, over and over again, the people that God used are sinners and broken, fallen people. And that should be an encouragement to us that we don't have to have it all together. In fact, God prefers, I think, that we have weakness because then we might think we are the ones who have um, brought about victory or done whatever. Um, we talked about how Gideon, before he was able to effectively go into battle, he had to first make peace with God. And what's really neat is I was kind of reviewing this tonight. I began to see this pattern in Gideon's life. And for those of you who love the feast like I do, this will be fun. Otherwise, if you're new to the feast, which I don't think anyone right now is new to the feast, then maybe it's not as interesting to you. But what I saw in Judges 6, as we looked at the life of Gideon, God actually brought him through the stages of the feast. So when Gideon first encounters God, you know, by the pistachio tree and he brings the matzah, doesn't he bring 11 bread to God, right? He brings the matzah and it's there that he, he it just becomes the memorial stone like Jacob. 
Remember when Jacob met God face to face, he wrestled them. That was like his salvation. Like he was changed. And so Gideon has this salvation experience, this Passover experience with God right there. Um, and he, and he even makes that, that memorial stone, he calls it Shalom. Mm -hmm. And so he has peace with God. And that's what Passover is about. Yeshua as the Passover lamb gives us peace with God. And then the next thing that he does is he tears down the altar of Baal and that's unleavened bread. What is unleavened bread? But getting rid of all of the sin in our life. So he takes the altar of Baal, tears it down. And there we have him going through that process of unleavened bread, getting all the sin out. And then the next thing that he does is he builds an altar to sacrifice to Adonai. That's first fruits. That's the, the resurrection to a new life. The old is gone, the new has come. And so here Gideon is um, going through the feast of first fruits. And then like so clearly the Bible says, then he's clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So here he's gone through Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. And now Pentecost is the Holy Spirit is literally clothed upon Gideon. And he is now ready for battle. The next thing he does is he grabs the shofar, which is the sign of trumpets. Right here he is at trumpet. So, I mean, it is so clear how Gideon is experiencing the feast of the Lord and God's plan of redemption, um, which is just a pattern, right? And so he takes the shofar, he blows it, and he assembles everybody for war. And what is his assignment? To save Israel. That's what the Day of Atonement is about, <laughs> the salvation of Israel. So God gives Gideon this assignment, go and save Israel. Like, wow. So that's the atonement. And so this whole, you know, chapter seven and eight, he's going to go through these battles and that's atonement. That's the salvation for Israel. So in the, in the midst of God saving Israel, he's, he's destroying his enemies. And that's exactly what happens on the day of atonement when Yeshua returns. So we see the feast pattern there so clearly. And then, and we'll get there at the end, but 822 begins to talk about them wanting Gideon to be their king. And that idea of kingship, that's tabernacles, that's establishing God's kingdom on the earth. So we see the full cycle in the life of Gideon. Um, and I think that's very significant. I thought that was just fun. So we're going to keep now reading the story. Um, oh, before that, um, the last thing that Gideon does, right, he puts out the fleece. And we didn't really touch much on it because there's a lot of different ways I think we could interpret that. But kind of how I was seeing that as it relates to kind of what you know, we're dealing with, like, he's living in very perilous times. He's living in a time that I believe is probably much like our own in the sense that there's probably a lot of deception, there's delusion, there's obviously idolatry, there's sin, there's a lot of things happening. So Gideon has to make sure that he's really hearing from the Lord. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Like, because there will be false prophets in the world. There will be these things that could tempt us from, you know, walking that path of truth. So for him to like stop and like really make sure, God, is this you? I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, so let's keep reading the story. We're going to now move on to Judges chapter seven. Um, and I really just love how um, our book champions Gideon for his faith in this chapter. And I almost was like, I'm just going to read like this whole chapter because there's so many powerful quotes, I believe, that, um, that can encourage us to just walk boldly as Gideon did. But I love how even how he starts this chapter, he entitles it Faith is Victory. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing to draw from this story. So as we go through, um, again, chapter seven and eight, we're going to see more lessons from Gideon. Um, and we're also going to see more insight about how these battles parallel to the last days. So those are the two things we're looking at. What is Gideon teaching us? And how does this teach us? What does this teach us about the end times in the last days? I'm actually going to start with a quote from page 73. Um, and our, the writer says this, he says, see the invisible, choose the imperishable and do the impossible. I'm like that is such like an encouragement. Um, and this is something that was um, written by, I can't remember, Vance Havner. I'm not sure who that is, but I just thought that was just this powerful. I mean, and these things are like, kind of easy to remember. So I think it's good to kind of say those out loud, but to see the invisible. Um, I mean, it's like what Paul tells us, like we fix our eyes not, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Um, and I think that's a very important thing, especially in the world right now. Like we have to first realize that the battle that we are in, is it carnal or fleshly? It's actually a battle in the spirit. Like there are deceptions and demonic activity in the earth right now. And that is our first battle. 
Um, and so it's important that we kind of take our eyes off of what we see here and fix them, you know, in the spirit, in the spirit realm and what God's doing there. Um, choose the imperishable, right? We can't grasp onto the things of this world and hold on to these earthly fleshly things. Like we need to choose the eternal things and then do the impossible. Like in the midst of a very challenging time, we have to rise up in faith and believe the word of God, step into action and trust that he's going to accomplish great things through our life. And, and really the, the call is to be like going back to Hebrews 11, like what were these people doing that they, you know, were this great hall of faith that we, we talk about when we look at Hebrews, like they were doing exploits for the kingdom of God. And I believe that God is wanting to rise up a people of faith that would step boldly into um, doing not just hearing, but being doers of the word and, and bringing about the victory that God has for us. Um, so I think there's probably another quote I want us to read. Um, he says, Christians are either overcome because of their unbelief or overcomers because of their faith. Like that is a powerful truth. Overcome because of their unbelief or overcomers because of their faith. Um, and that's what we're called to be in the last days, overcomers. Um, I'm going to keep reading because it's so good. He says, the Quaker poet John Greeley Whittier put it in this way, in my soul and I. He says, nothing before, nothing behind. The steps of faith fall on the seeming void and find the rock beneath. So regardless of what's happening around you, what he's saying is like, as you walk, the only ground and footing that you have is this rock of the word of God, right? That's all we need in these, in these perilous times. Like it's going to be like faith just believes what God says, right? And we walk out in faithful obedience and believing what God has said. He says the rock is the word of God. And so that kind of is how he wants to introduce um, the rest of Gideon's story here in chapter seven. And so God, you know, we just read about how Gideon tested God in a sense, you know, is this really God? And we put him through these two, these fleece things that he did. Well, now God's going to test Gideon. Okay. And that's, what's going to happen in chapter seven, because God is going to see if there really is faith in Gideon's heart for what he's about to accomplish. And so the way that God is going to test him is like, yes, God's already given him the word. He's given him the promise. He's actually, all of these men have been rallied to fight, but then God says, that's too many. We're going to actually pick up in verse two. The Lord said to Gideon, there are too many people with you for me to hand Midian over to them because I don't want Israel to be able to boast against me. We saved ourselves by our own strength. Therefore, proclaim to the people, anyone who is anxious or afraid should go back home while we stay here on Mount Gilead. 22,000 return, but 10,000 remain. So God is basically sifting out, right? He's like, and the purpose of that sifting is because he does not want Israel to boast that they did it in their own strength. Okay, so God wants glory for what's about to happen. And then secondly, God says, so here's how I want to sift. Anybody who has fear or anxiety or anything in their heart that would keep them from the faith that is needed right now, let them go home. And I love how that's really, that's really, I think, gracious of the Lord. Um, I think he's doing that one because he just, I mean, he already knew the frailty of man in Deuteronomy. It's actually chapter 20. This is, you know, something that God already established. He, um, in Deuteronomy 28, he basically says, if there's anyone fearful or anxious, let them go home. Anytime you're going into war, because God doesn't want fear to be brought into the midst of the battle. And I think that's important because fear has a way of permeating among the people. And that in itself is a battle. And so God wants people of faith, not people with fear. And in um, words, words be, I never know how to say that. That's why I don't say his last name, but I'm just going to call him Warren. Warren says it this way. Um, he says... Faith and fear cannot exist in the same heart for long. Either fear will conquer faith and will quit, or faith will conquer fear and will triumph. Um, I think, man, isn't that, that's on page um, 76 at the top. Fear and faith can't live together very long in the same heart. Either fear will conquer faith and will quit, or faith will conquer fear and will triumph. Yeah, that makes me think. So when you see that two thirds of the people leave and there's only one third of you left, don't be afraid of it. That's the Lord's doing. That's good. Yeah. 
is how many times are we looking at, like you were mentioning earlier, the churches are empty, but wait, the power of the faith of those who are yes. still there. Yeah. Can't, mm -hmm. we can't get disheartened. Mm -hmm. so no. we'll be discouraged and actually be encouraged because that means that God's sifting and that there won't be that fear that could ultimately bring others down with them. Um, so I just, I think, you know, that's what God's doing here. He's sifting out those who are afraid um, so that only faith will remain. Then we continue on. Um, and God's going to narrow down the army even more. And so he does this interesting thing where he basically like points out, okay, this one, this one, and it's all based on how they're drinking up the water. Now there, again, like our book says that there's a lot of different ways that people interpret this. I don't really know if there's any meaning other than what Warren kind of pulled out like there, you know, could be just something trivial. I don't really know. The Bible only tells us that this is what God did. Um, and what happens is that he boils it down to just 300 people in this army. Now, the number 300, for those who've gone through the Hebrew alphabet, is significant because it's the letter Sheen. We're actually going to see the number 300 mentioned also in the story of um, Samson. Um, he had, you know, so 300 becomes kind of a recurring theme in the book of Judges. And I believe that that, of course, is intentional. Um, the letter Sheen, and we're not going to go deeply into the letter Sheen right now, but one of my favorite letters, but it, you know, on the one hand, is a picture of the fiery, passionate love of God. On the other hand, it's a picture of God destroying and consuming evil. And so I believe that both of those are working together in the book of Judges as God is coming to save and rescue and also destroy evil. And so we have kind of this letter Sheen that's going to be kind of hinted at throughout these stories. Um, but here we have 300 men who God has said, okay, we'll, we'll use these guys. And I want to read verse seven in chapter Judges seven. The Lord said to Gideon, I will use the 300 men who lapped the water to save you. I will hand Midian over to you. Let all those, all these others go back home. Um, so they took the provisions and the shofars of the people. Then he sent all the men of Israel away, each to his own tent but the 300 men he kept. And I wanted to read that because like this was the promise that God gave Gideon. This is what Gideon believed because God told him, he said, I will use these 300 to save Israel. Like these are the men I'm giving Israel into your hands. So Gideon believed the promise of God. He took it as heart. And it was this that basically ultimately propelled him, you know, to the victory as he, he was strengthened um, by the Lord and believe the word of God. Um, so now God is going to continue to strengthen the faith of Gideon as we move on in chapter seven. Um, the next thing that happened is, is that God says, says to him, get up and attack the camp because I've handed it over to you. Um, but if you are afraid to attack, go down with your servant, Pura, and after you hear what they're saying, you will have the courage to attack the camp. So I love God, like just continuing, like he wants us to be strong and brave and be full of courage. And he's going to light the path for us and he's going to comfort us and he's going to encourage us. Like that's who God is. He doesn't just leave us like high and dry. Like God wants to us to be strengthened. And, and I believe in these times, like God will send words of encouragement. God will send people in your path to, to confirm what you feel God is saying to you. That's, that's God's heart. And I believe he does that even today. So they go down. Um, verse 12 says, now Midian, Amalek, and all the others from the east had settled in the valley as thick as locust. That language, again, like locust is language of the end times. We see that in Revelation chapter 9. Huh? Joel, also Joel chapter 1 and 2. Yeah, the locusts. Um, their camels, too, were beyond counting like the sand of the seashore. That, that language is also used in Ezekiel um, in Revelation chapter 21. It said, Gideon got there just as a man was telling a comrade about a dream he had had. I love God's timing. I just now dreamt that a loaf of barley bread fell into the camp of Midian. That loaf of barley bread obviously represents Israel, which is represented by barley, came to the tent and struck it so hard that it overturned the tent and knocked it flat. His comrade answered, this can only be the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all of its army into their hand, his, his hands. So God allowed him to hear this very much prophetic dream that God gave the enemy in order to confirm the victory that God was about to bring his people. So God strengthens Gideon in his faith. Um, 
Then we keep reading. I love what Gideon does next. Verse 15, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he fell on his knees in worship. Then he returned to the camp of Israel and he returned full of faith. Um, and I, I think that this pattern is something that we really need to pay attention to. Like God desires us to worship him. And we've talked about this in the past, like worship is a form of warfare. And I believe that as he was worshiping God, like what was happening in the spirit is that the enemy was being defeated in the spirit realm. Um, in my own life, I've had experiences where I was going through a, a time of testing or a time where I had to trust God for something. And instead of like operating in fear or worry, my heart was, you know, drawn to worship. And it's like, when you lift your eyes up onto the Lord and who he is in the midst of that chaos, there's a peace that surpasses understanding that guards your heart and your mind and Messiah, that the words of God are true. And so as we lift our eyes to him, as we enter into his presence and worship, there is like his perfect love cast out all fear. And he allows us to experience um, just a sense of peace and freedom. And, and so I think that that, again, that was stirring his faith. That was confirming in his heart, the faithfulness of who God was. And he was able then to, to go forward, you know, confidently that God would indeed bring about the victory. And I believe that as he worshiped, you know, you guys all know the song, raise a hallelujah. You know, I raise a hallelujah. I mean, I love the lyrics of that song, like in the presence of my enemy, I raise a hallelujah. And it talks about, you know, like, God literally, I mean, this is a story in first Chronicles, you know, God said to the, the children of Judah, I said, go and fight this battle. And he says, but this is how you're going to fight. You're going to worship. Right. Okay. So that, that literally is a way that we can engage the enemy. It's through worship. It is the warfare. Um, but I do use that song often when I'm like, I'm going to worship God and defeat the enemy. I'm going to raise a hallelujah. Um, so keep going. Um, we are on verse 15. He begins to worship God. Um, get up, he said, because the Lord has handed Midian, Midian's army over to you. He divided the 300 men into three companies. He put in the hands of all of them shofars and empty pitchers with torches in them. Some might read empty jars or vessels. Um, the, the Hebrew word there is like earthenware. So it's a clay um, jar with torches in them. Then he said to them, Watch me and do what I do. When I get to the edge of the camp, whatever I do, you do the same. When I and everyone with me blow the shofar, then you blow your shofars all around the whole camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And he uses those words because that's what was in the dream that the guy had. And the idea is most likely that this dream circulated throughout the camp. And so there was already this kind of sense of fear by you know, from the enemy and this trepidation. Um, and so this is the battle plan that God gave Gideon. He gave him, again, divine strategy. Um, it doesn't really make sense. It's very similar to like the w interesting strategy that he gave Joshua, right? And Joshua 5, like, you know, but I love each time that we have that connection and we have the shofar. You know, the shofar is the sound of God's deliverance. It's the sound of God's voice in warfare. So God, you know, is showing that he is accomplishing this victory for the people. Um, so Gideon and the hundred men with him arrived at the edge of the camp a little before midnight, just after they had changed the guard. They blew the shofars and broke in pieces the pitchers that were in their hands. All three companies blew the shofars, broke the pitchers, and held the torches in their left hands, keeping their right hands free for the shofars they were blowing, and they shouted, the sword for Adonai and for Gideon. Then, as every man stood still in place around the camp, the whole camp was thrown into panic with everyone screaming and trying to escape. Gideon's men blew their 300 shofars and Adonai caused everyone in the camp to attack his comrades. And the enemy fled beyond Beit Shita near Zerah, as far as the border of Bel Nikola by Tabat. So I love a lot of things about what we just read. And we're gonna talk a little bit more detail at the very end about some of those things and what they picture and symbolize. Um, but I love that the enemy goes running and I love that Gideon goes chasing after the enemy. Like that stirs up a whole lot of faith in my heart because we are going to face a very scary enemy in the last days. And God wants us to have so much boldness like Gideon and even chasing after the enemy. Like you always imagine like hiding in fear where God is saying, no, 
Remember, I love when Jesus says that, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the kingdom of God. The gates are stationary, right? The kingdom of God advances through the gates, you know? So we are, the kingdom of God is meant to advance. It's meant to push forward, push through, and to walk boldly, um, proclaiming and advancing the kingdom of God. Um, so we'll get back to some of those details about that um, at the end. The men of Israel were summoned by Naphtali, Asher, in both regions of Manasseh. So what happens is as they, you know, have this first kind of victory, um, as they blew the shofars, broke the pots, and the, the torches, you know, were up in flames, it caused confusion in the camp. They started turning on one another, and then people began to flee. And so now Gideon is going to call other tribes around to come and help them pursue the enemy. Because remember, there's only 300 of them and there's thousands of the enemy. So they begin to call on Naphtali and Asher in both regions of Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. Gideon sent messengers through all the hills of Ephraim with the message, come down and attack Midian and capture their rivers before they get there as far as Beit Barat and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim came together and seized the rivers as far as Beit Barah and the Jordan. They also captured two chiefs of Midian, Oreb and Ze'ev. They put Oreb to death at the rock of Oreb and Ze'ev at Ze'ev's wine press. Then, as they kept pursuing Midian, they brought the heads of Oreb and Ze'ev to Gideon, to Gideon, who had crossed to the far side of the Jordan. So a few things to note is that it's only just now that they're calling upon Ephraim. Ephraim, if you guys remember, was probably the, was the largest and most prosperous tribes. Remember when Jacob blessed all of his children? He also blessed the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And Ephraim was given this blessing to be prosperous. It's like, you know, Joseph. Ephraim and Manasseh under Joseph had this prosperous blessing, but Ephraim especially was going to be this huge, huge um, tribe. And so they were basically during this time, kind of like the leaders, like the tribal leaders of all the other tribes, like Ephraim kind of was the one they looked to, especially in the North. I don't know if that applies to Judah, but in the North, Ephraim kind of was the head tribe, but it's only now that Gideon calls upon them to help. And they do, they help by seizing two chiefs of Midian, Oreb and Ze'ev. Um, and I, I think it's significant that it says um, kind of how and where they died. One was death at the rock. You know, the rock, who is the rock? The rock is Yeshua. It makes me actually think, I just thought of this, of Daniel chapter four, when you see the vision of Hezekiah, where mm -hmm. God says that a stone uncut, you know, from with human hands comes and like crushes the enemy, right? So we have that imagery there. And then the wine press. Of course, the wine press is symbolic of the wrath of God, right? That's what is in Revelation chapter 14. When Yeshua comes, the, there's a harvest of wheat and there's a harvest of grapes. The grape harvest is the wine press where the enemy is being crushed under his feet. So I think this, again, is symbolic of the wrath of God crushing the enemy um, under his feet. Do you have any thoughts about the two princes of Well, you know, just as you said that, um, I think of the beast and the false prophet, yeah. right? Yeah, that could definitely be there. We're going to see that there's two other men in the story. So I don't know if it's an exact thing, but um, yeah, that two, that number two, I'm sure is significant. I want to actually stop here um, and go to, you know, as I think about how that wine press is symbolic of, you know, the end times, um, I want to stop here and go to chapter 83 of Psalms. And I want to read through this psalm, and I want to connect. Um, I want to show you not just with a kind of speculation or like, oh, this looks like this, this seven. Like, we can know with confidence that the story of Gideon is meant for us to learn about the end times. And the reason is primarily because of Psalm 83. And what I love what happens when you read the prophets, because everything foundationally is always going to be in the Torah. And then what happens is that things get progressively revealed as you go through scripture. And so as we get to the Psalms, like God has given more revelation concerning what was those events that were happening as we move towards the end times. When we get to the New Testament, more revelation is given. You know, Yeshua opened up the eyes of the men on the road to Emmaus so that they might understand what was written in the Torah and the prophets and in the writings. And so 
God continues to bring progressive revelation of his word as we kind of journey through it. And so when we're in Psalm 83, um, this is a Psalm of Asaph, and, and I'm just going to start reading it and we're going to make these connections. So he begins, God, don't remain silent. Don't stay quiet. God are still. Okay, I have to stop there because this language is going to directly connect. So this is Psalms. It's in the writings, 83. But it's going to directly connect to the prophets, okay? And that prophet is Isaiah. So kind of hold your place in Psalm 83, and we're going to look at Isaiah 62. We are all familiar with Isaiah 62. It is very much a passage about the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. Um, It begins just as Isaiah, I mean, as Psalm 83 begins, with for Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication vindication shines out brightly and her salvation like a blazing torch. Like when you hear blazing torch now, because we're studying in the context of the judges, think about Gideon's torches, right? We just talked about these blazing torches. So here in Isaiah chapter 62, God is speaking and he says, I will not be silent. He says, I will arise. And and this actually connects, connects also to Psalm 102, where God says, I will arise and show favor to Zion. Okay, this, these are talking about the same things. God has arisen and he has begun to show favor to Zion. He has taken action. He's not resting. He is actually rising up and he is not staying silent. And so that's the plea in Psalm 83. And it's coming directly, I believe, from Isaiah 62. So we keep reading Isaiah 62. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. And this is talking to Israel. Then you'll be called by a new name, which the Lord himself will pronounce. You will be a glorious crown in the hand of Adonai, a royal diadem held by your God. Then he begins to make good on his promises. You will no longer be spoken of as abandoned or your land be spoken of as desolate. Rather, you will be called my delight is in her and you, your land will be married. Guys, this is covenant language. This is language of tabernacles of God fulfilling his promises. (laughs) For Adonai delights in you and your land will be married and your young man marries a young woman. Your sons will marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, your God will rejoice over you. We could read through all of Isaiah 62, but we won't for the sake of time. But this whole chapter, this is a chapter that talks about watchmen being on the walls of Jerusalem, giving God no rest. It's about building a highway to Jerusalem for God's people. Like this is the promises of God being fulfilled in the last days at the end of this age for Israel and God's people. And so with that in mind, now we're going to return back to Psalm 83. So when Asaph says, God, don't remain silent, don't stay quiet, God are still, he is talking about because, but he's saying, fulfill your promises, right? Fulfill your promises, just like you spoke to the prophet Isaiah, and you promised that you would not stay silent, but you would vindicate Israel, do that. Because what's happening, he says, here are your enemies causing an uproar. Those who hate you are raising their heads, craftily conspiring against your people, consulting together against those you treasure. So what is happening here is that there is a time that is coming. This is prophesying of a time where nations will conspire against God's people, just as they did in the days of Midian. In Midian's day, it was very much the same conglomerate of nations. Let's read them. It says, they say, come, let's wipe them out as a nation. Guys, literally, Iran says that on a continuous basis. Let's wipe them off the map. Let's wipe them off as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind, they plot their schemes. The covenant they made is against you. Do you understand what that means? When these nations come against Israel, they come against God. And that's exactly what the the psalmist just said. When they conspire against Israel, they're conspiring against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and Hagrim, Gaval, Ammon and Amalek, Plashit with those living in Sor, Asher too is allied with them to reinforce the descendants of Lot. Guys, if we were to look at the modern nations that are described here, these are all modern Arab nations that are being described. And the Bible specifically tells us these nations in the last days are going to conspire together in order to wipe the nation of Israel off the map. And they do that as they do that, they're conspiring against God. And then it goes on, do to them as you did to Midian. And here's our connection to the book of Judges directly. 
to Sisra and Yavin and Vadi Kishon. We just read about them in chapters three and four, or whichever it was, four and five. Sisra, Yavin, that's, remember she, and I love Nancy, how you made that connection, like she crushed a skull. Like that is definitely Genesis 3.15, but the, that God would crush the head of the serpent. Like that imagery was there to point to that reality. And then it goes on. It says, they, they were destroyed at Endor and became manure for the ground. Here's Judges 6 and 7 and 8. Make their leaders like Oreb and Zeev. These are the two guys we just read about the end of Judges 7. Okay, so the connection of the story of Gideon directly speaks about the end times. Okay, these aren't, again, it's not speculation. We're not reading into it. The psalmist here shows us that there's a connection here, okay? Because the nations conspired during the time of judges against Israel. There was a seven-year oppression of the land. And here we see the psalmist crying out, all these nations are going to conspire against your people in the last days. God, would you don't remain silent, but stand up and vindicate your people. And then he says, make these nations like you did Midian, like their leaders, Oreb and Zeev. And then we'll read on in just a second about their princes like Zivak and Zalmunna. And here's an interesting thing that we, is a progression of revelation. In verse 12, if you have the complete Jewish Bible, or 13, it says, these men, they said this, the nation of Midian said this, let's take possession of God's meadows for ourselves. When we read in Judges, it specifically says they come in and they take all the harvest and they take all of the, the goods of the land. And that's what we read in Ezekiel 38. But also, and maybe even more dramatically, is that they are coming to take the land itself. And we know that that very much is the reality of what's happening in our world today. So that is what their ultimate goal is, to take possession of God's meadows for ourselves. My God, make them like whirling dust, like chaff driven by the wind, like fire burning up the forest, like a flame that sets the mountains ablaze. Drive them away with your storm. Terrify them with your tempest. Fill their faces with shame so that they will seek your name, Adonai. Even in God's judgment and chastisement, there's mercy. So, you know, the psalmist is saying, destroy the enemy, make them like dust, but in order that they might seek your name. He says, let them be ashamed and fearful forever. Yes, let them perish in disgrace. Let them know that you alone, whose name is Yahweh, are the most high over all the earth. So the, the battle in the last days is going to be specifically to take the land of Israel, to destroy the people of Israel, to take the land, and it's a direct affront against the God of Israel. And so the purpose of God's wrath that is coming is to rescue his people, destroy the enemies, and make his name great among all the nations. So Psalm 83, again, it, it's going to allow us to make these connections to the book of Judges very confidently. Um, and so let's go back now to Judges chapter 8. Um, and let's keep going on in this story. So the men of Ephraim, they complained to Gideon, why didn't you call on us when you went to fight Midian? Why did you treat us this way? So they're going to complain again. Remember, Ephraim is basically like the head tribe, the head honchos. And they're like, why didn't you call us when you had this first scuffle with him? You know, when he had those 300 that surrounded, he didn't call Ephraim. And so he uses wisdom here instead of kind of being, a, you know, hey, I just you know, we just defeated this army. Why are you kind of complaining? Instead of doing that, he recognizes the position that Ephraim has. And he instead appeases their anger by, by telling them, um, it says they were sharp in their criticism, but he answered by saying to them, how can what I have done be compared with what you have done? Aren't the grapes Ephraim leaves on the vines better than the ones his own tribe harvest? God handed over to you Midian's chiefs or Evan Zeev. What could I do that matches what you did? By saying that, he appeased their angers at him. And I think there's wisdom here. There's no reason to stir up strife among brethren um, because there's already this conflict amongst the tribes, right? There's the east of the Jordan, the west of the Jordan. There's the northern tribes, there's the southern tribes. There's already enough division amongst God's people that he uses wisdom. Um, and I love how Worsby points out the verse in Proverbs 15, where it says a soft answer turns away wrath. 
but a harsh word stirs up anger. Um, and that, friends, can be all you take home from tonight because that will go, that will do you good in life um, wherever you go in any situation. Like to walk with wisdom and to, for a soft, I mean, literally, I've used that over and over and over again in my life. A soft answer turns away wrath. Um, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I also think of the verse where I think it's in the, the epistles, but it says that man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. I mean, that's super convicting. Like we can have righteous anger and, and not sin, as it says in John. But when we try to walk in that anger, it is not accomplishing the righteousness of God. And I think that is definitely a posture that we need to take of humility and to even if there is opportunity for us to have offense or be defensive about something, the higher road to take is to answer softly and with gentleness and kindness. And um, it's amazing how that will literally dissolve, um, you know, tension and strife immediately. Okay, so let's keep going in chapter eight. Okay. By now, Gideon and his 300 men had come to the Jordan and crossed over. So we have to imagine now they're all the way on the east side of the Jordan. Okay, they're no longer in the um, proper state of Israel. They're on the east side. Remember that the two and a half tribes are on the east side. They didn't cross over with the other, um, their brethren. They stayed on the east side because they liked the land. Um, but remember also that Moses allowed them to do that, but he said, okay, but when in times of struggle, you need to make sure that you support and help all of your brothers on the west side of the Jordan. And sure enough, like after a couple centuries have passed, they got really comfortable where they were and they kind of disregarded the needs. And um, we're going to learn here that, you know, Gideon and his army, they're exhausted, but I love, again, they're still pursuing their enemy. And so now they're in a city called Sukkot, and he asked the people there, please, and this is in the land of Gad, please give some loaves of bread to the men following me because we are exhausted. And I am pursuing Zivak and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. Those two guys that they are still in pursuit of, are they, we, they were mentioned in Psalm 83. So he's still pursuing these two kings of Midian. But the chiefs of Sukkot said, you haven't captured Zivak and Zalmunna yet, so why should we give bread to your army? And so Gideon gets upset. So basically they kind of snuff him. They, they, they challenge him. They don't think he either, they don't believe he's going to be able to accomplish what he says, um, or they just don't care. And that's a really big problem because these are also Israelites. These are a different tribe, but they're their brethren. Um, and I think there's a lesson there for us. Um, when you, when you think about the tribe of Ephraim, as you know, that tribe continues to grow and ultimately becomes the name of the northern tribe. Um, so we have Israel and we have Judah, right? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Eventually, Israel also is synonymous with Ephraim because it becomes so large that it becomes Ephraim basically absorbs all the other tribes. So it's like Ephraim and we have Judah. And what happens with Ephraim is that Ultimately, the only tribe that remains like distinguishable is Judah, right? That's why we have the modern day Jewish people today. Mm -hmm. And so all these other tribes and they're and they're coming, they're more and more coming to um, see who they are. But a lot of these from the northern tribes went into the nations, right? A lot of them went to the nations and a lot of them are people in the church and they don't even realize it. And certainly not all of the church. I'm not, I don't believe in that two house theory, but a lot of Ephraim is in the nations today. And so I think that there's really a lesson that the church needs to hear from what's happening in the pages of Judges, because if we kind of took, you know, that as true, then Ephraim, in a sense, these tribes, or let's just say these tribes, not necessarily just Ephraim, but on the other side of the Jordan, which I don't even think it's a farm. I think it's the half tribe of Manasseh. But the idea is that these tribes that are not living in the land, not connecting to the Jewish people are represent, representative of those tribes in the nations, okay? Which I believe could also include the church. Like we're in the nations, okay? And so these tribes have the opportunity to help their brothers as they're thirsty, as they're hungry, as they're needing shelter, like, what did Jesus say in Matthew 25? When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. Like 
I believe, again, as we look at this as a slice or a picture of the end times, the lesson here that we should learn as the church outside of the land of Israel is when God's people are in trouble because they're on the front lines. Okay, God's people are on the front lines. Those pe Jewish people living in Israel are every day faced with the opposition. It is our responsibility as those living outside of the land to provide support for God's people, to provide food, to provide water, to help Barry and Batia do all of that actually on the ground. Like we have a responsibility as God's people to help, to extend our hand to them. And I think this is what's going on here is that, you know, Gideon wasn't as disappointed or discouraged that they were still having to pursue the enemy. He was very discouraged that he had to like chastise his own people. His own brothers didn't help him. And that is something that I think we really need to take to heart because we are brothers with God's people and we have a responsibility to feed and to clothe all that Jesus said when he says, whatever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, some by his own people you've done to me. And so I think that's something that we really need to take to heart and learn from what's happening to these tribes that are outside of Israel. They're outside on the other side of the Jordan. And they're basically, they become either like disconnected in their hearts towards their brethren or so comfortable with the nations around them that they don't even really identify themselves with Israel anymore. Right. They, they're so comfortable with it or they're appeasing the enemy. Right. They're afraid maybe that if they, you know, help Gideon and his army, that he's not actually going to capture these Midianite kings and they're going to come back and maybe bring, you know, judgment against them or something. Who knows the reasons why? But I think it's, again, a lesson and we need to search our own hearts. Like, are we willing to help God's people? You know, are we so comfortable, you know, appeasing this? the gods that this nation served that we would kind of fall into that camp of pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel, BDS type of, you know, you know, that there's a, there's a, it's happening in the church. That's my point. And it's important that we um, boycott divestment and so oh, sanctions. sanctions. Yeah. So where they basically boycott yeah, anything in Israel. So there's a, big movement in churches to follow that way and to basically, again, if you're opposing Israel and God's people, you're ultimately opposing God. And so we need to be a people that support his people and um, provide what they need in their time of need. Actually, President Carter was big on that. He would say that Palestinians should have the land. And I found it interesting that the Biden became president one of the first things he did was to go visit Carter. Really? That is interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely, I mean, it's all a part of the end time narrative, right? You know that, again, ultimately, the enemy wants the land because God said, this is my land. He's put his name on it. So it shouldn't surprise us that there's this <coughs> continuous battle for the land of Israel. Okay, so we're going to keep reading. So he goes to another town and something very similar happens. So Gideon, you know, he was kind to Ephraim, but now to these two um, tribes on the east side of the Jordan, he's very upset because again, they aren't, they're actually working against him and for the enemy. And that's a big difference than Ephraim just complaining. And then we move on to verse 18. So he does, he captures Zivak and Zalumna. Sorry, I can't say those names, but he captures these bad Midianite kings and he's going to now bring them in front of his own son because they, we didn't know this earlier, but now we just learned that these kings actually killed all of his brothers. And so he, yeah, Gideon's own brothers. And so Gideon's going to now basically follow Torah and take vengeance on his brother's death. Like the next of kin, you're supposed to actually avenge your, your brother's death. And so he's going to have his own son. He's asking his own son to kill these men. And his own son is very young and is too scared to do it. And so these two kings say, well, how about you do it, Gideon? So Gideon does it. Gideon kills them. Um, you can read it if you want. I'm not, I'm just paraphrasing. But I do want to read um, where he says in the end of verse 21, it says, so Gideon got up and killed Zivak and Salmuna. Then he took the ornamental crescents from around their camel's necks. 
Um, and that is a very important piece of information um, that often is overlooked, but should, again, like there's been for a long time in like Christian world, popular Christian culture, this idea that the Antichrist and the kingdoms coming against Israel and God's people in the last days are from Rome. Okay. And, and I think that's just a misunderstanding or interpretation of Daniel's prophecies. However, the Bible actually is very straightforward and clear about these nations, like we just read in Psalm 83, are a coalition of Arab states, Arab nations, actually (coughs) named, right? Um, And here we see kind of a hint at that, even in the book of Judges, um, all the way down to the, the ornamental crescent around the neck of the camels. And we learn that these, this kind of jewelry, this, this ornamental crescent is for what the, the Ishmaelites, okay, the sons of Ishmael would wear. And this goes all the way back to ancient worship of the moon, okay? And so this predates modern day Islam. This is something that goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. Um, this goes back to the time, you know, in Ur. Like this basically was the first pagan worship, okay? And there was other gods. There's the moon, the sun god and, you know, there's Ish- Ishtar or something. I don't know all of them. There's three primary ones, but the moon God was, was, and there's, there's evidence in the scripture. I'm not, I didn't pull those scriptures, but I believe it's Isaiah 14 that I'm actually going to see if that's it, because if it is, I think it's an important connection um, that we make right now. I think they just, they, it was just jewelry. They adorned them. I think they wore them as earrings, as nose rings on their camels. I think it was just, yeah, it was just kind of like their thing. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I am going to, and I'm. this is from way back. I didn't study this, but I think I remember. So if you go to Isaiah chapter 14, um, and this is a, a chapter that, you know, we interpret to kind of describe the fall of Lucifer. Okay. And it says in verse 12, how did you come to fall from the heavens? Morning star, son of the dawn, the Hebrew there. And again, I don't have the Hebrew word because I didn't study it, but can be interpreted as the moon. Okay. And so I'm pretty sure that's the one. Maybe I'll, I'll check and verify, but this passage talks about, I'll keep reading. It says, how did you come to be cut to the ground, conquer of nations, You thought to yourself, I will scale the heavens and raise my throne above God's stars. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly far away in the north. I will rise past the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Okay, so this is, you know, traditionally interpreted as this is the fall of Lucifer. Like, this is what he did. And connecting it. Okay, and so this moon worship has proliferated it all all across Mesopotamia ancient times it was in every you know Babylon everywhere um and it still exists today like you can read and I didn't look up the passages in the Quran but apparently there are passages that speak very plainly openly about worshiping the moon the moon god in the Quran um so the connection that Islam has made to this ancient moon worship is very clear and evident so that we can look at this as a, again, like a prophetic kind of word speaking to that true reality that in the end times, it's the same story. You know, it's the same players. We don't even have to really look. We don't have to, again, it's not subjective. We don't have to make things up based on our own worldview and understanding. The Bible clearly states who the enemy of the end time will be, that these Arab nations that right now are Islamic nations, that that will be the vehicle of the Antichrist in the last days to come against God's people. And again, we don't even have to look very far to see that that happens already now, right? Mm-hmm. They are still like Iran, like it's still the point, the purpose of these nations is their desire is to wipe Israel off the map. So God is just showing us these little hints. It's like, remember in Isaiah chapter 14, where he says he declares the end from the beginning, like he already knew what was going to happen. There's not a mystery to God and it doesn't have to be a mystery to us. He's opening our eyes to see these things. Yeah, that's the crescent of Islam now. They're marked. They're marked. Yeah. 
And so that's still the sign of the enemy. Did you have something to say, Becky? Unmute. So I go closer to the screen because I'm trying to hear, like that's going to help me. Oh, when, when they speak, no, wait, yeah, I just, I can't always hear what they're, if it's a question or what they're saying. Yeah. Katie was just talking about how, you know, we'll know the signs and the, the signs have really been consistent throughout time, you know, like past, present and future. Like there's really, there's not as much mystery to it when we understand the signs and the symbols that the Bible presents to us. Is that in a nutshell what you were saying, Katie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forget the, the scripture reference of Matthew, like Matthew 24, even like yeah. the fake, you know, when he talks to the fake Jews, they should know the signs and seasons. Yeah. I mean, so this is another. Yeah. I mean, so hard. she's just talking about how Jesus was so clearly telling the people in his day that you will know the signs, right? He, when he talked especially to the Pharisees and says, you can tell when a storm is coming, but you don't know the season that you're living in. Um, he talks about the fig tree being a sign, you know, so God has clearly given us signs um, of what is to come and things to look for. And she's just saying, well, these crescent moons are kind of one of those signs, you know, it's right here, plain as day in the scriptures. Um, and especially when you connect them to, like, it's profound to me that Midian, the Amalekites, in these other Eastern nations, like it's very much talking about a conglomerate of Arab nations that have come against Israel. Um, and it's the same battle. And again, looking back to, you know, when we talked about the Melekites, um, last week, we talked about that these were the, the first people that battled when they came out of the, out of Egypt. And God says that from generation after generation, you will battle the Melekites. So what's happening in Israel today is a result of them not completely driving them out of the land. They're still, playing out these same battles that were happening in the time of judges three 3500 years ago like nothing's new under the sun the same battles are happening for the same reasons um so here we are now and we're just now going to be culminating on that final battle the battle of armageddon and there's hints again in the book of judges that speak about that battle um we didn't talk about this i don't know if we did specifically but they gathered in the Jezreel Valley, which is where the, the nations will gather in the last days as they march to Jerusalem. I believe the battle won't take place in that valley because um, the Bible speaks about that battle happening in Jerusalem. So I believe it's more of like a holding ground. It's a, it's a place where they come together, staging. a staging, yeah, staging for all the, the nations to come. And then they're going to march on to Jerusalem um, and, and the battle will ensue there. But it's mentioned here in Judges that that's where they were. And it says there were so many camels, like it was like the locusts covering the land. It was in the Jezreel Valley where the Battle of Armageddon is spoken about. Okay, so um, ornamental crescents. Is there anything else that I wanted to read about that? Okay, so now let's pick up in verse 22. So it says, the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you saved us from the power of Midian. So Gideon replied, neither I nor my son will rule over you, but the Lord Adonai will rule over you. Um, so again, like going back to that, you know, the pattern of what we're seeing here and what it's showing us is like, as soon as God delivers and rescues his people and destroys his enemy, he will establish his kingdom and rule over them. So this is, again, like a hint at that Gideon was not the chosen king. Um, and so Gideon does not fulfill that role. His, his part of, was just to show us how God will judge and rescue. But Gideon here, ironically, like asked for his, like all of these, like the spoils of war. So he gets like all this jewelry and all this cl cloth and he makes an ephah, like a garment. And he really oddly like falls into idolatry, like right away. And because the, the temple is erected, uh, tabernacles erected in Shiloh at this time. He's not in Shiloh. He's like in another part in the north. And he, so he like creates like this best. I don't think the Levites were really practicing at the time as much as we know or we read about, but he like does this weird thing where he kind of makes himself an appointed high priest of, of sorts. And they, you know, worship this image that he creates. And then he's like, no, no, I won't be your king. But then he's like, give me all your stuff. And then he also like has 70 wives and lives very much like a king. So it's sad that happens to Gideon, but he's not perfect and he's not meant to be. He's just supposed to be a shadow. Um, kind of a shadow too, not 
too much further when the Lord of Kingdom Israel sets up their own. Yeah, yeah. Katie's talking about how you know the Northern Kingdom eventually sets up their own worship site up far in the north. We went there. I don't know if you were on that trip with us. Yeah, we went there. Um, but they set up their own tabernacle or their yeah a temple. Yeah, and Dan. That's right. Okay. So this is interesting, though. Um, the Israelites at this point they recognize their need for a king. And I think it's important to realize that God didn't intend for them not to have a king. He just wanted to appoint the right king. Okay, but they, they at this point in the game are realizing, hey, you know what? It might be good to have some sort of centralized leadership to come together as a people instead of have these tribes that constantly battle one another and this, you know. And so they recognize at the end of what has just happened that they need a king. And they ask Gideon to be their king. Guys, this foreshadows, again, the last days that when Yeshua comes in power to destroy the enemies and rescue his people, what are God's people going to do? They're going to say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeshua be our king. And they're going to invite him to be their king, to rule over them. And, you know, I think that... Um, that on one hand speaks to like a pattern of that, but I also can see how before that happens, how our world is moving into a state where people are wanting a one world government, right? And there's going to be a time, huh? Yes. And so there's going to be a time when people cry out for the wrong king. And that's when the Antichrist is going to be able to come and establish his rule for those, you know, seven and a half or three and a half of the bad years. So on, on both sides of it, like eventually we're going to, as a people, deceived and deluded, cry out for a king and it will be the Antichrist. But ultimately, God's people, as they're being rescued by the true Messiah, will cry out for him to be their king. So I think we just need to be aware of that. So I'm going to, so it says at the end of this chapter, and there's more that happens. Um, like I said, he falls into this weird idolatry. Um, it says that he became a father of 70 sons because he had many wives. He also had a concubine in Shechem. And this is important because this story will happen in chapter nine. And she too bore him a son whom he, he named Avimelech. And Avimelech is, uh, means my father is king. <laughs> So he named it. I mean, so that's his own son was like named after the idea that he's king, which so we see that something's going on with Gideon. But it says that the land had rest for 40 years during the lifetime of Gideon. Um, and then they are going to repeat that same cycle. We see that they start following the, the bales again and they make covenant with foreign gods. But I wanted to kind of end with this encouragement. Um, and actually comes from Paul. So I want us to learn from Gideon, like how to walk in faith. That's why I don't like talking about like what he did wrong at the end. I want us to focus on like how Gideon shone the light of God's hope and truth in the midst of a very dark time in his land. And so I want us to remember the faith that Gideon had, but I want us to also see how Paul understood what was happening in Gideon's time. Because Paul is going to string pearls together and weave these ideas as he's talking to the church in Corinthians. Um, he's actually going to, to encourage us with this encouragement. He says in first, second Corinthians chapter four, verses six and seven, he said, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So I'm going to break down what Paul says by going back to the scriptures that he's actually pulling from in the Tanakh to give us deeper understanding of what Paul is encouraging the saints with. So it actually goes back to Genesis 1.1. Okay, he said, you know, let light shine out of darkness. I'm going to spend a minute here because... There's so much that's happening in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 that we need to dwell on it for a second. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is formless and void, 
and darkness covers the face of the deep. And the spirit of God hovers over the waters. And so you have to go back to ancient times and put yourself in the mindset of an ancient person. The waters represent chaos. The waters, that's the abyss. That's darkness. That's unknown. That is a picture of evil and chaos. So when the Bible begins with this powerful picture, this imagery of the earth is formless and void and darkness is in the face of the deep. When you're hearing that, like there's evil and there's chaos and there's something very fearful. Then it says that the spirit of God hovers over it. And so this idea is that God is higher. God is above God. This is under the feet of God. So he is more powerful than the chaos and the darkness that's covering the face of the deep. And it's here in this moment that God speaks, let there be light. So God shines light into the darkness and begins to divide it to make order out of the chaos. But it, so in the mind of an ancient, when they hear this, that God hovers over the water, this then gives us understanding of why God chooses to divide waters whenever he anoints Moses to deliver his people. What does he do? He gives Moses the ability to divide the waters and walk on dry ground. The authority over the enemy, the authority over the chaos, that's the power he gave Moses. That same power he gave Joshua and the people when they walked on dry ground across the Jordan River, he cut the water off. The water is a picture of evil, chaos, the enemy. And God is showing his authority and his power and that power that he wants to give his people. And then ultimately we see that displayed with Yeshua. What does he do when he gets on the water? He walks, he walks on it. it. That's what I was thinking of when you said it was like he walks on that rock. What was it earlier? He said yeah. on the rock. But man, it's like Jesus walking on the water was like, underneath with the rock exactly but also underneath them was the enemy and that's yes. the point like the enemy is under his feet he's crushing the head of the enemy as he walks on the waters and so that imagery is so powerful for an ancient because they're seeing our god is sovereign and powerful and this evil and chaos is subject subjected to him right and so that's the picture that's what genesis 1 1 is beginning with okay the supremacy of god the power of god and so when we, when Paul now is going to talk now about this, so Paul's saying, let sh light shine in the darkness, okay? So he's recognizing that we're living in dark, evil times, okay? And his encouragement begins with, let light shine out of the darkness. Like you go into the dark and you command light, right? You speak order into the chaos. You walk in authority that you've been given. The enemy's under your feet. All of that is in the words that Paul is giving us. He also is referencing a very powerful passage in Isaiah chapter 9. So let's go to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 is another very familiar passage to us. We kind of pick it apart during the Christmas season and just read a little bit of it. But I want to read kind of more of it to give us the context. But Isaiah 9... Um, I'm going to begin in verse 23 of chapter eight, if you have complete Jewish Bible. It says, but there will be no more gloom for those who are now in anguish. In the past, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali were regarded lightly. But the, in the future, he will honor the way to the lake. He's talking about the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee. Beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Goyim. So this area in the north became known as the Galilee of the Goyim. Like the nations had come and invaded these, these nations, uh, or the northern tribes. And so it became regarded very lightly. Like that's why they said, how can anything good come from Nazareth? It's that area, okay? It's been overtaken by Gentiles. It's no longer set apart. But Isaiah prophesies that there's a time that, that those nations up there, that the people living in darkness have seen a great light. So in darkness and chaos and disorder, God again has spoken light into that darkness. God says there are people living in darkness have seen a great light upon those living in the lands that lie in the shadow of death. Light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice in your presence as if rejoicing at harvest time. The way men rejoice when dividing up the spoil. So there's a couple things going on here. Obviously, what he's talking about is 
It's going to go on in verse six and be very clear for unto us, a child is born, a son is given all of these prophecies about Yeshua being born in, in this area of the Galilee. Okay. Well, he's been born in Bethlehem, but he's going to shine. He's going to live his life in Nazareth and in the area of the Galilee. But it says that because of this great light that's shining in this dark area, God is going to enlarge the nation. He's going to basically reclaim that area for his kingdom. He's going to establish his people in that land. So remember, the birth of Yeshua as the Messiah wasn't the end goal. The end goal was that Messiah would come into the world to rescue his people and fulfill the promises to Abraham. So this, this is what's going to happen as a result of the Messiah shining in that darkness. God's going to enlarge the nation of Israel. and He's going to increase their joy. They're going to rejoice in your presence, rejoicing at harvest time. Harvest time should connect us back to the time of the judges. Okay, harvest time. This is when they're being invaded by Midian and all of the Amalekites and all of the people. But harvest time is to coat. Harvest time is the season of our joy, right? They're joyful. They're harvesting. They're, it's the season of God dwelling with man. And so this reversal of what was being taken from them in Gideon's time is being restored to them in the time of Messiah, okay? And it says, for the yoke that weighed them down, the bar across their shoulders. So yeah, guys, this was the weight of Midian on the people of Israel. Okay, this was what was bearing down upon them, the oppression the, of the nations that were that were in the invading their land. It says, in their drivers go, you have broken as on what? The day of Midian. Okay, so there's this direct correlation here to the time of Midian because this time spoke of the redemption. It spoke of how Messiah would come and rescue them as he did in the days of Midian. You have broken the oppression as on the day of Midian's defeat for all the boots of soldiers marching and every cloak rolled in blood is destined for burning fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, dominion will rest on his shoulders, and he will be given the name, wonder of a counselor, mighty God, father of eternity, prince of peace, in order to extend the dominion and perpetuate the peace of the throne and kingdom of David, to secure it and sustain it through justice and righteousness, henceforth and forever, the zeal of Adonai Sabaot will accomplish this. So God showed his light in this dark place to bring about freedom from those who were oppressed as in the days of Midian, okay? He brought a son who we know is Yeshua, ultimately though, to establish the kingdom of God. So just as in the time of judges, they wanted to end with God's kingdom, right? Gideon, be our king. There's coming a time when the chastisement that God's bring, but the redemption that he's bring will end with him establishing his kingdom. It will be as the days of Midian, but it will end with an established kingdom, the kingdom of God on the earth through the one who was given as a son, Yeshua, our Messiah. So you can see how all those connections, but Paul, so going back to this verse in Corinthians, Paul is drawing from those very ideas, okay? He's drawing from what happened at the days of Midian. He's drawing from God shining light and darkness at Genesis 1-1. And then he goes on to say that that light, that same light that broke the backs, you know, the oppression off the backs of his people, that same light that brought order into chaos that hovers over darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That has been imprinted upon you. That light burns within you. What verse? This is first, Second Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. So that light is in your heart. This is where she started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Second Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. For God said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you see how that light speaks of the glory of God? And that light has shown in our hearts. It's in us. And we're to reflect that light. He goes on to say, but we have this treasure, this treasure of God's light, the wondrous glory of God in jars of clay earthen vessels to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. I want to say two things. Lamentations 4.2 says this, the precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. So in Lamentations, we actually have a direct reference where God calls his people earthen vessels. 
Lamentations 4.2. It's not the same word that's used in Judges chapter 7, but it's the very same idea. Because God, remember, and this is all connecting us back to Judges, because this was the strategy that God gave Gideon. He said, take shofars, take these earthen pots and, these, and a torch. Okay, these are the, the tools that you are to use to defeat the enemy. Okay, so what we see here is that Paul, pulling from limitations, pulling for judges, recognizes that these earthen pots are the people of God. That this glorious light that God has shown in our hearts, he put in these earthen vessels. Why? For the same reason that he sought, you know, sift through Gideon's army and had only 300, so that to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So we are meant to be these humble earthen vessels shining the glory and the light of God so that people might see how surpassing beautiful and powerful God is, right? It's to point the, the you know, back onto him. Go ahead, do you have some, okay. So God, so my encouragement then is to us as we, as we hear these words of Paul and as we really ponder the weight of what we've been given and we consider that in light of like the world that we're living in, like we are now, we're in a state where it is dark and chaos. It is just like it was in Genesis 1-1. It is just like it was right before Yeshua broke through the darkness and shined the light of hope when he came the first time. We are now in this place where darkness covers the face of the deep and the spirit of God is saying, let there be light. And that light, Paul tells us, has shown in our hearts, like we carry that. Paul tells us that we are earthen vessels. And just like in the story of Gideon, with broken clay jars, trumpets, and torches, that's the same divine strategy that God continues to use today, that we have to be those broken vessels. What they do, they broke the vessels. So we're called to be broken clay jars, broken vessels. And what happens when the vessel is broken? The light. The torch was able to shine brightly. The glory and the power of God, that's what it was symbolic of. So, right, so she's talking about we don't hide our light, right? We don't, we don't let it, like, hide, don't hide it under a bushel, right? That's all. Right. But that's what it is. Uh-huh. Scriptures, yeah, we're a city on a hill. It can't be hidden, right? Let the light shine. So we are the clay jars broken so that the life and light of Yeshua can shine through as we trumpet, as we blow the shofar of God's deliverance. Like we are to be that that trumpeting sound, trumpeting the gospel of his kingdom and coming deliverance. And the flames, the torches of God's Holy Spirit within us will produce good works and faithful obedience, causing others to see the life and the light of Messiah in us. So I believe that's the, you know, the the message of what happened in Gideon's time of why God chose to use those. And Paul really pulls that for us. This isn't something that, again, is not subjective. Like Paul sees that, like that light that was being represented during Judges 6 or 7, that was the light of God's spirit. That was the light of God's fire. That's the sheen, right? Sheen, like that represented by fire. And that was the broken vessels were to be the people of God, broken in submission and humility to him, allowing that light and that that flame to shine through. And then the the shofar is that sound of God's deliverance. Like this was God's battle. He was the one who was going to win it. And then that light shining was going to hope. I mean, that the point of it now is that that light that shines in our hearts, as Paul is saying, it needs to be shown in the darkness. It needs to be um, a beacon of hope for people in the world because they are very much um, in a state of confusion and chaos and need the hope that we have. So let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that it is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. I thank you for the way um, that your word just um, convicts us and challenges us and encourages us. And I ask, Father, that you God, I know that faith is a gift. Faith is something that you give us, but it's also something that you call us to stir up, um, to remember your faithfulness and to learn and to to practice. And so God, I pray 
um, that you would help us exercise that faith that you've given us. God, that you would help us to be bold and strong and courageous and to be like Gideon, believing in the word that you've given, God, knowing and trusting that the battle is already won, the victory already belongs to us. God, you have already defeated the enemy. He's under our feet. God, you walk on the water, you hover over the darkness. And I thank you that you've invited us into that same space to sit with you in, in heavenly places. And so God, I pray that you would remove the veil from our eyes God, that we wouldn't fix our eyes on the things of this world, but that we would fix our eyes on you and that we would walk boldly, God, into this season and this time. God, truly, we need to be a people set apart and a people that bear your name. So God, anoint us for this time. Let, let us be broken vessels and let your light shine boldly in us. God, we love you. We thank you that you are an all-consuming fire. Um, and so we pray that you would, again, have your way in and through us for the glory of your name. In advancement of your kingdom in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.